Hello, and welcome to the Draft to Digital Spotlight. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I am honored to have with me in the virtual studio today a Mark who has a much easier to spell and pronounce last name. Mark O'Neill, welcome to the uh, D2D Spotlight. Uh, thanks for having me. So just to give people an idea of um, you and uh, where your, what your background is, tell us a little bit about the books that you write, et cetera. Uh, well, first of all, I, I live in Germany. I've been living here for the last 20 years. Okay. And um, I'm originally from Scotland. And the books that I write are German spy thrillers uh, based with a female protagonist instead of a male protagonist. Okay. Uh, this is because um, when, you, when people hear the word secret agent, they tend to think about a man, about okay. James Bond, Jason Bourne, you know, the man saves the world, the woman's there as the sex object, you know, cooing right. on the shoulder. And so I decided to flip the genders around a little bit and have the women in charge this time and have the men as playing second fiddle. And uh, to be quite honest with you, I thought that they w it wouldn't work. I thought that people wouldn't accept a woman as the main character. But I've actually had quite a lot of positive feedback from people who have said it's quite a refreshing change to... Uh, to have a, a woman in charge of a spy department. So uh, I have to ask a question about that. Were there any um, uh, issues that you had or concerns you had trying to write a female perspective as a as a male? Um, well, I had a lot of um, I had a lot of females write to me saying that they they read the book, um, but they were concerned about my perspective as a male. Right. <laughs> they said that uh, uh, only a female could write about females, which I thought was a really, really strange thing to come out with. Uh, but th they said that uh, they didn't want th they didn't want the character to be defined by her sexuality. And I said, well, that's that's something which I have never, ever tried to do, because, okay. as I said, you know, with things like James Bond and Jason Bourne and so on, the women are always seem to always be there as the the sex objects, you know, the, right. the people to fall into bed with. And I, I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I think that demeans, that demeans a uh, woman a lot. And so, and to uh, basically put the women into the man's world and show that uh, the women can do the job just as good as the man. And I think, I think people have noticed that and I think they've, they, they're starting to enjoy it. So tell us about, tell us about this, the spy, who is she? Her name is uh, Sophie Decker. Okay. She is uh, an army major. Well, she was a captain in the first book. And she, uh, well, she's basically a, a bit of a renegade, you know, a bit of a, a rule breaker. She, doesn't, she isn't well liked by her superiors. Um, she's always she's always telling everybody to go to hell and, you know, and okay. whenever there's a law or a rule, she breaks it. And then she gets asked by the German Chancellor to form a special intelligence unit that answers only to the Chancellor. Okay. And uh, this is this is the concept of Department Eighty Nine, which is the the name of the department that she runs. And so the books are basically about how her department deal with the enemies of the German state. Okay, so uh, that was the next question I was going to ask you: Is uh, you're in Germany? It, yeah. Is it set in Germany or is it's it set in set Germany? Elsewhere? Okay, it's in, mostly in Berlin, but I've tried to sort of spread out a bit among other places in Germany as well. Uh, even in the the town where I live, I've tried to put it in there as well. Um, I have to say though that the reviews in Germany are not very complimentary. I don't think uh, a lot of Germans are very happy with the idea of this uh, secret German intelligence unit running around the country killing people. So it would seem that it would seem that uh, people outside Germany like the books. People inside Germany do not like the books at all. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, the, the 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 most common phrase I've heard is it can never happen here. You know, so basically everything that, he, that I see in the books, they say, well, that can never happen here. But then I, I always think to myself, well, how do they know? <laughs> the whole point of a secret intelligence unit is that it's secret. It's secret, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's like an American saying, oh, well, the CIA would never kill anybody or, or MI6 would never kill anybody in Britain. You know, I mean, they don't know. So, 
you know, uh, plus it's it's fiction. So, you know, you have to suspend disbelief for a little while and sorry, suspend belief for a little while and and just go with the story. So uh, I'm curious. So, so is this uh, the 89 is the name of the department 89 department yeah. 89. That's like the MI6 then. Or? Yes, that's right. <laughs> I went through quite a few incarnations. It was department 99 first until we did a quick Google check and then discovered that that was the series name for a book about vampires. Okay. So we had to very quickly change that. <laughs> or to but, Canadians, that was uh, Wayne Gretzky's number, which you, you can't use it anywhere else, right? The hockey player, so. Oh, all right. Okay, well, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, you know, we were going through different, my wife and I were going through different variations, you know, like, well, can we have it as this and this? And I thought, oh, to hell with it. I'll just do 89. I don't care anymore. So <laughs> it, it just stuck. Oh, that's hilarious! Now uh, we were talking about uh, Germany because that's that's where you live and have mm -hmm. lived for how long? Twenty years. Twenty years. Okay. Oh, almost twenty. Wow. Um, there's got to be differences, obviously, that you're aware of because obviously you um, you're publishing probably to Amazon using Draft Digital to get to some other markets as well. Um, the difference between the German writing and publishing market and North American or the UK or whatever, you're probably well well aware of those things a lot more than somebody like myself who's in North America. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences? Uh, well, first of all, it's worth pointing out that Germany is the third largest ebook market in the world after the United States and the United Kingdom. Okay. So uh, Germany is not a country that you can ignore, really. Uh, I read somewhere that 65% of all females read ebooks here and over 50% of all males. So Wait, is that 60% like, of all males uh, read ebooks or, or males. females? 65% uh, of all females. Not all female readers, but all females in general. No, all female readers. Oh, okay. I got, I got really excited that that many people are reading. No, no, 65% <laughs> of all female readers. Wow. <laughs> they're, they're reading on a Kindle or um, on another device. A Tolino device. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I was going to mention the Tolino, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a really, really big market, and you can't ignore it. It's, uh, so if, when you're starting to translate your books for the first time, German should really be the first language that you translate into. As um, I think Spanish is the next one up from that. But uh, German being the third largest market covering Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, right, should be the first foreign language market that you that you go for. And they have, as you just mentioned, they have a, an ebook reader called Tolino. Yeah, but, uh, let's, let's learn a little bit more about that because you have a lot more insight into that being in Germany. Yeah, it's a bit like the it's a bit like the Kobo reader, I suppose. It, it takes e EPUB books, and it was made by a coalition of German bookstores. So it was uh, this book source called uh, Hugendubel, Talia, Weltbild, and all these other high street stores that um, I think they got together to uh, provide a credible alternative to the Kindle reader. Right, like and a so, homegrown alternative? A homegrown alternative. Yeah. So they came up with a Tolino. And um, the Tolino is actually quite popular here. I mean, Amazon still holds about six between 60 and 70% of the market here. So uh, Amazon is still the big player here. Uh, but Tolino takes up quite a big chunk of the rest. And... Um, as I said, it's something that you shouldn't really ignore. I mean, I feel a bit hypocritical because at the moment I'm only in Kindle Unlimited at the moment. So I'm not actually in Tolino right now. I'm planning on going into Tolino in the next couple of months right. when my Kindle Unlimited subscription ends. Uh, so it's something that is definitely um, in the works for me in the next couple of months. Well, I think that's one of the important things about publishing is you have to experiment and play with the different opportunities and markets and see what's working for you and what's not working for you, right? Yeah. Plus, you know, you've got to admit that Amazon do hold all the cards, <laughs> no matter what yeah. country you're in. So, um, you know, you've got to go where the money is. But, yeah. um, but, you know, I think it would be doing a bit of a disservice to Germans if you publish a book here and you don't have it with the main high street stores, you know, so... Um, if they if they have the Tolino reader, then you should really have it on the Tolino, and draft a digital. 
uh, sends it to Tolino. So it's it's quite an easy process. Right. So I want to I want to talk a little bit about that as well. So there is the Kindle, obviously, that exists in Germany, which you can buy from Amazon, the German site uh, of mm -hmm. Amazon. Um, and then there's also I could walk into one of the high street stores and and buy a Tolino reader right at the bookstore, or yep. I can order it from probably. And and I think the Tolino Alliance has, as I understand it, like hundreds of. It's not just the big stores, but there's also some independent um, bookstores. It's possible. I'm not totally sure. I just heard that the, these these big stores were the ones that uh, started it in the first place. But I'm sure there are others. Uh, there's, there's one I can't remember the name of it, which is owned by the Catholic Church. And they're in it as well. And so, um, somebody said, uh, "Don't don't ever try submitting steamy romance erotica to these people because obviously, being owned by the church, they're never going to accept." They're probably it. not. Gonna, yeah, they're probably going to filter those. <laughs> those yeah. So the, that's the other thing about so Germany. I mean, I, I I know Germany, and the only time I've ever been in the country has been uh, for Frankfurt Book Fair, which is. Mm -hmm. Probably the in 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 I, I call it English language, although it is multinational, mm -hmm. all the languages. The um, because there's twelve buildings, uh, Frankfurt Book Fair. There's it's one true. building that's English, yeah, <laughs> and all the English publishing things that are going on, and probably the biggest English language uh, collection in the world, where agents and publishers and, mm -hmm. and and authors get together. But then there's all these other languages. Like there's entire floors the size of for, for Americans the size of Book Expo America just for that language. Yeah. Uh, and there's what, uh, 10 or 11 different? Uh, there's something like that. But yeah. the Frankfurt Book Fair is not very uh, friendly towards independent uh, authors. You know, I was, going to, I was going to go last year to the Frankfurt Book Fair, right. and somebody said, don't bother. They said they'll laugh you right out of the room if they, when, they tell, when you tell them that you're an indie. Yeah. So, you know, it's very much a, a closed shop for um, traditional publishers and uh, for people with traditional publishing contracts, which I think is a shame because, you know, obviously, as you know, indies are starting to take over the, the publishing industry. And so I think, you know, they should be a little bit more tolerant towards us. Maybe, maybe in the future, who knows? It, uh, you've seen, uh, for example, London Book Fair. I know that the... Um... That author uh, pocket that they would they would put up in the tuck it away into the far corner of London Book Fair, <laughs> <laughs> growing and growing and growing and growing because you you know authors have have the need to write and tell stories and readers have the need to want good stories. Mm -hmm. um, allowing that to happen actually allows the book industry to prosper. So I, I can imagine they're probably just a little bit. Um, well, the other thing too is I mean Germany is. A, a huge book market, and I know print books are still gigantic uh, yeah, in, in many yeah. European countries like Germany as well. So they're probably still still learning the the love and joy of ebooks as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah, print books are still are still very much loved here. There's even a law uh, protecting the prices uh, for print books as well. Um, one retailer cannot discount the the book the the price of a print book. From another retailer, the price has to stay the same. Right. And this is supposed to protect the smaller bookstores from the likes of Amazon. Uh, so um, you know, it's this is a country that even regulates the price of the books. I don't, I don't know if this is the same in other countries or not. If there's, um, I don't know if, if in Canada where you are, if there's laws that protect the books prices. No, for, I know France has those uh, really stringent uh, laws that that protect right. uh, book prices. Uh, so France and Germany are very similar in that approach. I know when I was uh, president of the Canadian Booksellers Association, mm. <laughs> I was working with some some publishers and, and bookstores uh, that were being forced out of business uh, mm -hmm. because of price policies, especially because we're such a small, uh, a large landmass, but such a small population uh, really impacted uh, by, by the US. And so our prices are significantly higher just crossing the border. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there were a lot of challenges related uh, to that. And we looked at Germany and we looked at France as two protected markets, which was interesting. Um, so there, there was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which I, I think it was, is interesting, is, is you had mentioned um, being a writer and dealing with chronic illness. Is that something that you'd be willing to chat about a little bit today? Yeah. Um, well, it, the idea came up because uh, the, a writer called Christine Catherine Rush that you that you and I know about, she wrote a book about 
um, being being a writer and having to deal with chronic illness on a daily basis and right. the, the struggles that she deals with, um, having to deal with her illness and at the same time uh, trying to write as well. Uh, she, you know, obviously I'm not going to go into her issues. That's not very fair to, for me to do that to her. Uh, but um, and as far as I'm concerned, um, I've got epilepsy. I have chronic depression. And these are these are conditions that are very difficult for a writer because obviously, as you know, writing is a very labor intensive process. It's something that you need to focus on, you know, have a, a laser focus on. And you've got to have the energy, the concentration, the willpower. And when you've got depression, it's very, very hard to come up with um with the right attitude to write. I've spent the last, oh, how long now? Six weeks, two months, uh, looking at a, a manuscript in progress. Now, normally I can write a book in about four to six weeks. Right. I, now, I, I've spent the last six weeks looking at 5,000 words and unable to get any further. Now, people have put this down to the coronavirus phenomenon. You know, people have said, oh, other writers have said to me, oh, well, I, I'm the same. I can't go any further with my book right now because I'm depressed. Or, you know, right. the, the lockdown, the, you know, the, 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 the restrictions that are in place and so on. And it's, it's the same thing. You know, it's, it's when, you are, when you have depression, when you have a chronic illness, it's very, very hard to... Um, to do a job like writing because you know if you don't have the inspiration then you're just sitting there staring at a screen and you think to yourself well am I in the right job <laughs> <laughs> yet I have readers around the world who are buying my series books and stuff like that 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 obviously doesn't even come into play when when the depression sets in right yeah, and you know, and you get people who email and saying, "When's your book coming? When's your book coming? You're you're taking too long." You're, you know, and it's like, oh, get lost. You know, <laughs> I don't need this. You know, so, it's so, nice. It's nice to be wanted, but at the same time, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I could do without the pressure. So how how do you deal with that? Because obviously, this isn't something that just happened. This is something that you have been dealing with for for a while. Uh, how long has it been now? Eighteen years. Eight, so you've been dealing with this for 18 years. So obviously, yeah. yeah. And uh, now it may be triggered by something like lockdown or other things going on, or you never know. Is well, it seasonal? Uh, uh, yeah, it's mostly seasonal. I mean, yeah. this time of the, this time of the year, as the sea, as the temperatures are changing and so on, things that you know, the depression starts to get a bit bad. Uh, so you know, I, I always have trouble this time of the year with the writing and so on. Um, it's just something that you, you just have to try and, and get through. You know, I sit down I, with the laptop and I try to do at least at least 2,000 words a day. Uh, and I read somewhere that 2,000 words a day is, what, 14,000 a week? So that's, that's the way you got to look at it, is that it may only be 2,000 a day, but it's 14,000 a week, 28,000 every two, two weeks. So, right. you know, and all of a sudden you've got half a boot there. Yeah. So that that's 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 the attitude that I try to uh that's the attitude that I try to have is that every little bit helps. You know, so I may only say I may say to myself, Well, I only managed a thousand words today, but if I do another thousand tomorrow and another thousand the day after that, and by the end of the week I may have ten thousand done. So um, you know, it's a bit like a roller coaster. I've just got to ride ride it up and down and when I'm having a good day, I just write more. And when I'm having a bad day, I just have to do 500 words and then call it a day. Okay. Well, it's, I'm, I'm amazed that you're actually still able to plug on uh, and keep going. <laughs> Got bills to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Right? That's your job, right? Yep. Yeah. So you are a, a full-time writer? Oh, oh, I wish. Uh, uh, well, I, I do. I do writing for uh, a client on a tech website. Okay. Uh, I'm also an editor for that site, so uh, that's my full time job at the moment. Okay. Uh, but I'm really hoping that in the next year or two, I can stop that and I can go to writing full time, writing books full time. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's good that you have a plan uh, for that. 
Oh, well, the wife is waiting with bated breath for me to tell her that she can quit her job. <laughs> I, t- I told her, I said, you know, don't, 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 it's not going to happen right away. Yeah. <laughs> I'm suddenly thinking about the Kenny Rogers song, Lady. Uh, or She Believes in Me, that's the one, is it? Uh... <laughs> I don't know. I do not, I do not listen to Kenny Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> give, give, give away a little bit of my country background here. Um, so um, you had actually mentioned epilepsy as well. Does that actually impact your writing? Only when I've had an attack, you know. So if I've had an attack, I sleep for hours. So, uh, you know, obviously if I need to sleep, I need to sleep. There's nothing I can do about that. But um, afterwards... <laughs> Afterwards, I find actually that after I've had, after I've slept and I've got over the attack, actually I find out I'm a bit clear, a bit more clear headed, believe it or not. So um, once the, once I'm past all the confusion and I'm past all the tiredness, I actually find myself to be a bit more productive, which is a, l- a little bit strange. You would think that you would think that epilepsy kind of scrambles your brain up a bit, but um, I find that the brain kind of fires a bit more on all cylinders after I've had an attack. So I, I can't explain that one. Well, after you've had an attack, and then and then and then you have the recharge where you're actually able to sleep and rest, right? Yes, yeah, I, I sleep, I rest for a few hours, and then all of a sudden it's like ping. <laughs> so, is this now? I uh, I I grew up with epilepsy, and I actually uh, I outgrew it in my mid twenties. I have haven't had to be on medication since then. Um, is this, and, and, and I was lucky, I was very fortunate that, uh, that a medication was able to control my seizures. Hmm. Uh, have you, is there a medication that helps or is? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, t- I take medication, but I mean, it's, it, these things are never 100%, um, guaranteed. So, right. you know, it, it's like, like the depression, it just comes and goes. So, um, you know, it's just, I've just learned to live with it over the years. Uh, but I have to say it's getting a lot better recently. But uh, as I said, you know this this spark, you know, when you wake up, you know it's 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 like I've it's like I've been writing the book in my head when I've been sleeping, oh. and then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> where's the laptop? <laughs> well, I mean, and the mind is such a marvelous, wondrous, mysterious thing too, with all of the things going on. I mean, it it, it feels it. You kind of remind me of the. Uh, even when we're not putting words on paper, finger on fingers on keyboard, you're still writing, right? When you're when you're when you're sitting there staring into space, when you're sleeping, when you're when you're whatever, walking the dog, doing the dishes, yeah. you're probably processing. Stuff yeah, I mean, I'm I'm writing scenes when I'm out walking the dog. I'm I'm writing scenes when I'm just sitting on the sofa watching TV. You know, so you know, my wife might say like, you know, like what's wrong, or you you you've got a weird look on your face or something, and I'm just saying I'm writing. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, I think I think that's just part of the job, isn't it? Is it sometimes you find it difficult to switch off, right? Uh, and um, you know, so, so even though you're not typing, that doesn't mean that you're not working, right? So I'm sure it's the same with you. If you when you're sitting watching TV or you're or you're cooking or you're doing whatever you do, whatever it is that you do in your spare time, you're probably doing the same thing. You're probably writing in the next chapter in your book. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually what's happening, and I miss I miss twenty minutes of the program. What just happened? Because I I saw this idea where I would have taken the plot, and and I'm and I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or I'm sitting here talking to myself, and you're sitting you're sitting there writing your book. <laughs> well, I I try to pay attention when I'm interviewing someone for a live interview. So, <laughs> um, you were also before we got on the call, you had also talked about uh, you're now getting into audiobooks. When did when did that start, and how is that process going for you? Oh, that's something that I've been wanting to do ever since my first book came out three years ago. Um, but the problems were that first of all, it was too expensive. Right. Uh, I was getting quotes of three thousand dollars and up, and that's <laughs> obviously too much. <laughs> And second, um, Audible is not available in Germany. Audible, uh, is like Audible is not available in Germany. Well, it's not available for authors to ACX, upload. ACX, you mean? Through. ACX, yes. Okay. It's not available to for for authors to upload in Germany. It's only available for the UK and the US and the US and Canada, maybe. Yes. Uh, so I thought that it was kind of going to be very difficult for me to do an audiobook. But then when Drafted Digital started, find find a way voices, is it called? 
Yeah, the partner a partnership with Find Away Voices. You're right, sure. And it's it's basically an aggregate platform that will send your audiobook to everywhere, including ACX. And I thought, well, okay, suddenly the barrier to getting my audiobook in is lowered. Um, but then I had to find somebody who would uh, not break the bank to read my audiobook for me. And I'm very fortunate to have a, a very good friend who used to work for a German TV station, and he's a, he's very much into audio and video editing, and he said he would do it for a fraction of the cost. Awesome. Uh, his name is Marco, so I don't know if he's watching. If he is, hi there. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea who's watching. Uh, <laughs> could be anybody, could be no, nobody. Uh, so, there are people watching. I can I can see that we have live viewers. Right, okay. <laughs> that's their names. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've lost the plot now. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, uh, <laughs> right, you you yeah. got him to do your book for. And right. Yeah. So he did the book. Okay. And we we uploaded it to find a way two days ago, I think it was. Oh, just really that recently. That recent, yeah. So they they said, oh, it could take up to forty five days for the book to be approved by ACX. So I thought forty five days. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Forty five days. That's actually pretty pretty short right now for the delays that I've heard from ACX. It's only but forty-five what? days. Are you audible? Audible. Yeah, but why? But why is it forty-five days? I mean, that... well, they—they, they, uh, I think uh, it's a combination. From what I understand, is a combination of uh, just a, a mass of new titles coming into the ecosystem, combined with, uh, I think they're doing more monitoring and and uh, of the accounts because of the use of uh, the coupon codes that they right. used to give away. And, right. and, and and then of course, then everyone uses the coronavirus, uh, this digital company that was always digital suddenly can't operate because everyone's working from home, right. uh, which is, is, is sounds more like an excuse. But there's been, a, I think there's, I think there's been a number of factors that have impacted and it's uh, impacted Audible and it's also impacted one other uh, player. I haven't seen it affect Google or Kobo or uh, or uh, Nook, uh, their audiobooks, or, or Apple. Apple, they all seem to be relatively quick. I think I think I think the woman at Findaway told me that it would take between one and three weeks for the other people, and forty five right. days for ACX, which is pretty. Yeah, one to three weeks is pretty typical. Um, and ACX was usually in the in the in the upper of that, like one right. one and one to two weeks. It's just you know, it's just kind of like bursting my bubble a bit. I mean, you know, I'm uploading all the all the files, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then it says it will take up to forty five days. I'm like, oh no. Well, no. But that's just. But you have to remember that's just one platform, right? That's with Find Away Voices. You're going to get into forty three retail and library channels. So one platform, yeah. And I know Audible is a big one. Three weeks though, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big one. It's a big one. How how long is the book in terms of hours? Three hours. Three hours. To be quite honest, just from my own experience, if the book is is only three hours, uh, I, whatever Audible decides, because they randomly uh, generate the price, it may not do as well on Audible because it's a shorter book than uh, a longer book because of the way that the token system works, right? That $15 oh. a month that you pay. You right. may get more a la carte sales from other platforms, which is what I experienced with my first Right. My first audio book cost me, it was, it was, it was over three grand and, and I haven't made it back yet. And oh. I've sold very few on audible. I actually have made more of my money off of, because again, it's only, I think it's, um, it's maybe only four and a half, five hours. So I haven't, the, the price is below $15 us. Therefore it's not as attractive to the average audible listener. Well, I said uh, yeah. ten dollars because it's only a novella. So yeah. So that is that actually, and, and actually it's a good thing you're with Findaway just from my own experience, because you'll probably get more sales on uh, Scribd and Biblioteca and through library channels. Cause right now I'm available through library. It'll be in uh, Overdrive and other library markets where mm -hmm. that's, I suspect where you're gonna make the majority of your money off the uh, audiobook. Okay. So yeah, so don't despair just because it's not an audible yet. Ah, pff, that's just one of, you know, I know, but you, uh, but you know what they always say: if it's not on Amazon, it's nowhere. So yeah. that's true, that, and that is the problem. Because at least, at least on Amazon, you'll get the you get the ebook, you get the print book, you get the audio book, and they'll all be listed together, which is yeah. actually helpful. Yeah, I get that, but it's coming. It's coming. 
You've you you have more patience than that. You've been in this in this market for a long, long time. I'm 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 positive you're going to stick this one. Uh, up. The money from the first audio book will pay for the second audio book. So this is why I've got my fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So how did you find, uh, this was a friend of yours who's a professional actor? Um, how did you, I mean, were you friends before? He, 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 was an, he was an editor, an editor at a German TV station. So oh. um, he's he's a friend of my wife's and this is how we met. So, Cool, cool, awesome. Well, congratulations on it. I didn't realize you. your audio book was that fresh, that you just took it out. Oh, yes, it, is. <laughs> it feels really well, weird to hear somebody reading it out. Now, is this the first book in the series, the novella? The first book. So it's a great place part. for people to start. I'm sorry. It's a great place for people to start then. It is, and it's a short book, so it's not it's not something that uh, will take people a long time to get through. Yeah, uh, it's supposed to be the one that sets everything up so that people can understand what happens in the next book. So it's a great place to start. Just, just Mark, listen, listen. I can hear it now. I can hear these voices going. Oh my God, that was a great audiobook. When are you going to release the second one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as soon as Mirko's got time to do it, he's got he's got three kids, and so it's a bit oh, hard. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, I actually look forward to checking it out because I've got a subscription to Kobo Audiobooks, and I'll be uh, adding it to my account when my credit comes up next. <laughs> wow, next. my first sale! Yeah. Oh, as soon as I see it there, you got to let me know. Now. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're going to get into the questions that we have from the live uh, the live viewers. Uh, so thank you. I, um, Carol, speaking of cool Canadians, uh, she asks, uh, do you have a routine or a certain task or trigger that you use to help you sit down and write even when depression is hitting you hard? Uh, I... I first of all, I, I watch a lot of comedy. Yeah, uh, because obviously depression is obviously something that makes you very, very upset, sad, down, whatever. And so I tend to watch a lot of comedy and a lot of monologues. Uh, so, you know, if, uh, it, it, I'm sure you know Stephen Colbert yep. and um, Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon. And so when they're doing their monologues at the start of the show, at the start of their shows, um, I'm watching all of them and the fact that they're funny and the fact that um you know it gets it gets my brain working because i'm listening to them i'm listening to how they express themselves i'm listening to how they uh, t uh how they uh say things and so i've often found that listening to monologues uh, helps me uh, get my writing brain started and uh, listening to comedy gets gets the depression lifted a little bit and uh it's it's difficult because, you know, it, it it just depends what kind of a day you're having. You know, I mean, there's different levels of depression. There's different stages of depression. Uh, you know, it can be very light. It can be really, really severe. But I often find that um, I often find that monologues and listening to listening to comedy and reading just gets me in the right frame of mind. It's it's interesting that you mentioned comedy because I have read uh, studies and reports that show that laughter actually stimulates a particular chemical reaction in your body and in your brain, and mm -hmm. that potentially it's obviously it's stimulating your writing. But I'm wondering if it's stimulating other things. I, I know it's I know it's actually technically healthy. It actually supports your immune system. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, just just having that laughter obviously is going to have a physiological reaction, and obviously, and, and depression, right, is a biochemical uh, thing uh, that yeah. that happens to your body. Uh, that you know, so it, that's cool that you found uh, that you found that that works well for you, not just for depression, but it also helps you as a writer. Uh, and British humor, okay. No, I mean, I mean, okay. As I said, I, I I listen to Stephen Colbert and I listen to Jimmy Fallon and so on. But it's British humor that you need to listen to. So Monty Python. I mean, I know you're a fan. Monty Python, yes, of course. You know, yeah, you and, can't uh, go to British humor without including Monty Python. What, what else from British humor? In Blackadder, you ever oh, seen Blackadder? Oh, of course, brilliant show. Yeah, before he be became Mr. Bean. Before you became Mr. Bean, right? Exactly. So, you know, the, the, these are the these are the people that get me out of the out of the the grind and get me going. Do you do you use humor in your writing as well? I do, but I have to be careful because 
<laughs> how can I say this without reverting to stereotypes? Um, German's humor is uh, special. <laughs> so <laughs> Germans don't do humor uh, the same way that we, uh, that uh, British people do humor. So uh, I put humor in my books, but I often get emails from people who don't understand the jokes. Really? So, is it, is yeah. it that different? Yeah. Well, I, I try to make my jokes subtle. I try okay. to make my jokes uh, not too difficult. But I, I get these. I get these people emailing me saying, uh, you know, on page 243, you told a joke, a knock-knock joke, oh, or a joke about a chicken crossing the road, and I don't understand. Could you please explain it? And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do I, do, I, do, I, uh, do I answer them and indulge them, or are they just, are they just taking the piss? Or, I mean, I mean, come on. I mean... <sighs> It, it almost it almost feels like there can be a companion guide the the jokes explained yeah the secret agency of of, of, of department 89 and the jokes explained the secret yeah. uh, the secret passages I could yeah I could write I could write the companion book yeah all the jokes explained that's a good idea <laughs> or I could have a, I could have a page on my website I mean Carol who just answered that question she just did my website uh, totally redesigned it Sweet. I should have asked her, I should have asked her to do a jokes page. There you go. Well, you can ask her now if she's uh, still uh, watching live. <laughs> <laughs> you may as well conduct business while we're here. <laughs> okay. You keep talking. I'll just I'll just talk to her in the comments. <laughs> so, that was great. That was a great question. I want to I want to get back into a little bit of the German uh, market and ask about that. So we talked about uh, the expense of getting a book translate uh, uh, converted into narrated into an audiobook. Mm -hmm. Because you live in the third largest. Um, you know, domain for for publishing and books. Uh, have you considered the translation? Uh, some of my books have been translated. Yes, okay. actually, it's the same guy who does the audio books. Oh my god, this it's, is awesome! Doing the translation. <laughs> uh, it, first of all, it was a lady called Annette Spratt who did the translation. Yes. Yeah, you know Annette. Yes, yeah, I've actually uh, had chat. I've chatted with her a few times. Right. Okay. Um, and then after a while, she got really, really busy with other translation projects. And so I asked Mirko to do it. And he says, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> so he's doing the translation and the audio books as well. So he's making quite a bit of money off me at the moment. But uh, to be fair, I'm making my was, money back. You said he was busy. It's like, does he do the audio book or does he do the translation? <laughs> And he's got a day job, so he's doing his day job, and then in the evening when his kids go to bed, he just locks himself in his office and just gets on with it. Wow. Oh, wow. I can imagine. I'd love to chat with him about how he balances those things, too. So um, I, I have to ask, then, how has, how has marketing the books in German been different from marketing the books in English? Um, it's not really been that different. I mean, I have been using Facebook ads. I've been using Amazon ads because Amazon ads is now opened up in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's relative like, what, the last six months, right? Right. Very, very. It's very new. And I've also been doing BookBub ads. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> BookBub ads. Yeah. Uh, so um, it's not really different from... It's not really different from promoting it from any other country. Uh, I'm just I'm very fortunate that um, that these platforms are now opened up here in Germany. As you said, the Amazon ads one has only been is only been here since this year. So right. uh, before then, it was impossible to use Amazon ads in Germany. Yeah, which is kind of funny because I mean uh, Germany was always uh, I mean even from my first visit to Frankfurt Book Fair. Uh, hmm. I'm not going to say how long ago it was, but I mean Amazon was big there then. Still, so it's, 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 I'm surprised that they weren't uh, quicker with that. <laughs> yeah, well, Amazon gets there eventually. Yeah, yeah, eventually. So, how um, how about the covers? When you when you do the covers uh, for English or the covers for German, are are they the same cover just with the translated text, or are you using different imagery? Well. For the first book, I did a different image. Uh, this is when I had uh, another book designer. She persuaded me to do a different design. And then she unfortunately had to stop doing my covers. So um, 
I just decided to use the same covers. So I figured, well, since I've paid for them already, it seems silly to put new images on them. So I just I just took the, the English titles off and put the German title on and put the German blurb on the back and you know you've got yourself a new you've got yourself a new cover so you know some people have said to me well you know that's a bit unprofessional well can't you at least come up with a new cover but then i think well why you know i mean the cover is perfectly fine just right. change the title change the blurb and you've you know you've got yourself a, a new cover so um it, apparently there's a whole science to this about you know like different countries have different styles of covers and so on but i haven't seen any um i haven't seen any indication that the covers that i'm using are, are hurting in any way cool now um i i had a uh, another question i was going to ask you and it was related to your uh was it marcus was the gentleman who uh, is editing uh, for you and uh, or, or translating? Mirko. Marco. Mirko. Oh, Mirko. Sorry, I, I I thought there's just this was just a plethora of marks here. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mirko. Uh, so you talked about him uh, working full time and then and then finding time to write. How do you divide that up with the uh, the work that you do? That's you know the the paying day job as well as the writing. Do you, is there a particular time of the day that you prefer to write, or how do you how do you divide that up? Well, obviously, the bill paying uh, comes first. So, right. you know, and I've got the wife to answer to as well. So, you know, I can't I can't be sitting around writing books all the time because it's always like, so, you know, if you've done the bill, if you've done the bills work first. Okay. So that comes first. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate to work from home. So I'm able to just get up in the morning and just try and start work as quickly as possible and get the other work done first. And then sometime in the afternoon, uh, towards early evening, I can then start on my books. And I quite often find that in the evening is the best time to write my books. I don't know why. It just, I, I just can't really write in the mornings. It's, it's. I'm, I'm more of an evening person when it comes to writing. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure some psychiatrist will come up with a reason for that, but I, I don't know. Uh, when, when, when do you prefer to write? I see. I'm a morning person because once my day starts, the all the creative spirit that that I come out of sleep with, I want to capture that and funnel it into writing before I turn on the email. Because the minute I turn on the email, the minute I start looking at projects and work and tasks I have to get done, a different part of my brain shifts into gear, and that creative, we'll call it the creative muse, runs madly, giggling out of the room, saying, "Ha ha ha! You can't catch me." That's at least how I picture it. Yeah, well, I mean, this is your day job. So, I mean, I mean, you. This is what you do all day. So you don't yeah. have another job or another boss to to answer to. So I suppose you've got a bit more freedom to. Well, no, no, I do have a boss, and I do. Have... <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have the luxury of working from home, and fortunately, I I haven't been having. Well, fortunately, it was some, one of the perks is I haven't uh, had to travel in the last uh, three and a half months. Yeah, uh, so that's given me a little bit more time. Um, but I, I still try to first thing in the morning, put on the coffee, do the writing first. If I can get some writing done this morning, it was more maintenance work uh, for a mm -hmm. published, like, you know, formatting a book and sending it off to story bundle and stuff like that. So it wasn't creative. It was just, you know, make sure everything looks good. Uh, and that was my writing time. And then I jumped into scheduling interviews for draft to digital and, and meetings that I have and, and stuff like that. So um, well, you have another job then you work for draft to digital. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that I do have, I have a, a higher friendly power to answer to, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one last question that I'm, I'm dying to ask you because Ooh. so it was three years ago that you first started publishing the department 89 um, books. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so a lot has happened in three years. You've published a lot more books. You've you've translated books. You've gotten audio books written. What's some of the advice you would go back to younger Mark three years ago and say, uh, here's something you should know that's really, really important to understand as a writer? Uh, I would say don't get too hung up on writing lots and lots of drafts. Uh, I often hear people say, oh, well, you know, you've got to write your first shitty draft and then you've got to write the second draft, the third draft, the fourth draft. And I I think basically now after three years that it's writing lots and lots and lots of drafts and taking years to write 
I mean, I don't take years to write, but I know people who have taken years to write. It's not really writing. That's, I mean, it, 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 the way that I do it now is I write one draft, I then go back and read it and correct it and put it out. So at the most, I do two drafts. But at the start, I was doing three, four, five, because that was the accepted wisdom. Everyone was saying, you've got to do several. You've got to do three. You've got to do four. You've got to have an editor, a line editor, develop, development editor, a proofreader. And I think to myself, at this rate, I'm never going to get anything out. I'm never going to get any books out. You know, I'll be like one a year if I'm lucky. So when I decided to stop doing all these different drafts and only do two at the most and edit my own work because, I mean, okay, this is sacrilege for some people, but I don't have an editor because I am an editor. This is this is, this, this is my day job with the, with, the, with the tech website that I work for. So I figured if anybody could edit my own work, it's me. <laughs> Plus I can save some money. <laughs> so I need to only do two drafts and edit my own work. I got the work out faster. And I started making more money faster. So I would, if I could go back, I would say that that you know don't don't get hung up on all the drafts and don't get hung up on on hiring lots of editors and proofreaders and and also beta readers as well. I mean, I tried the beta reader experiment and it went down like a lead balloon. I I, I don't know if you have beta readers yourself. Uh, for your books, but I tried it with mine, and it was like writing by committee. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, you know, it's like a group of people sitting around a table, like complaining about the, where the commas were placed and where the where the where the hyphens should be. And I thought, no, and you can take the life out of the book when you have that much. Uh, that, that, yeah, the life out of the book. Yes. Right. Oh man. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to share uh, insight, wisdom, perspective with me today. Let uh, let listeners know where they can find you online. Yes, you can find me online at my redesign website at www.markoneal.org. Great. Well, thank you, Mark, for joining us. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. And thank you, Carol, for making his website look beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Carol.